Today I'd like to show you an unusual old tape deck that I've imported from Japan, but I'm going to be using this more as a way to talk about how quickly cassette decks, as a general thing, evolved in the 1970s. But to understand why this particular deck appealed to me, especially if you're new here, it might help if I list a few of the things that interest me. You're probably familiar with the My Favourite Things song from The Sound of Music, and while I'm also quite partial to a brown paper parcel tied up with string, I'd like to list a few of my favourite things. So I'm going to start with cassette decks, particularly unusual cassette decks. I'm also partial to digital clocks, especially flip clocks, and you probably know I love a good VU meter. I also enjoy discovering consumer electronics that were made specifically for the Japanese domestic market. And when it comes to hi-fi, well, brushed steel fronted components are my favourite, and these were at their peak in the 1970s, which also happens to be a time when lots of interesting hi-fi ideas were being tried out, some of which came and went in the blink of an eye. So, those are a few of my favourite things. And here's one thing that ticks all those boxes. So this is the CT50T from Pioneer, a machine that I don't believe got a release in the West. It came out around 1975, and it's a very 1975 machine. By that I mean the mid-70s were a pivotal time for home hi-fi cassette deck design. Standards and features were still being defined, and manufacturers were competing with new ideas to see which ones the public wanted and which they weren't interested in, and that's what makes this period the most interesting to me. The unusual idea that Pioneer tried out with this deck was to incorporate a digital timer inside the main body of the device. Now the machine was very similar to the CTF2121 and that's a model that did make its way over here in 1975. The two devices appear to share many of the same components. Of course the fascia on the CT50T has been rearranged to incorporate the clock. But significantly, while it's gained a clock, it's also lost the Dolby B noise reduction of the other model. If we look at the Pioneer range that was available in the West in 1975, we can see the 2121 was positioned at the bottom end of the range of hi-fi machines. In this German brochure, you can see someone has handwritten prices next to a couple of the machines. That range topping 9191 cost 1250 Deutsche Marks, while the 2121 was around about half that price at 635. Now that's still a lot of money in 1975, but in the great scheme of things, if you take the bottom of the range 2121 and then remove the Dolby, you can see that the CT50T, that wouldn't have been considered to be a premium model. But if we look at the machines that were available around this time, you can see how quickly things were moving for cassette decks. Take a look at this page for tape recorders in Pioneer's 1973 brochure. We've just got these two console style cassette machines. But moving on to 74, there's now three of the console style and one stackable unit. But by 1975, things have moved on. Now there's more of the hi-fi component style units than there are the countertop ones. And by 1976, while they're still selling a range of the older style machines, it's clear that the future lies in the component style range. It's amazing how quickly the range changed and how much of the work that defines how cassette decks would go on to look in the future took place over just a brief period in the mid-1970s. As one example, this picture shows Pioneer's big design changes from 1975. We've got the old and the new here. They've dropped the thin rounded transport control levers of the older models and we're moving on at this point to new flat piano keys. 
Perhaps more significantly though, they've also moved away from this 30 degree angle tape mechanism to a more familiar vertical system. By 1977, pretty much the whole range had adopted that new design aesthetic. And while my main tape deck is a 1990s model that outshines all those models as far as specs go, I get a lot of enjoyment exploring the variety of machines that were produced when manufacturers were still experimenting with the form. Take this JVC deck as an example. It looks a little bit odd to our eyes now, and that's because over time we've just become accustomed to, on a cassette deck, a, a cassette door would be located on the left of the machine, or perhaps in the middle, but the right, well, not so much. But then again, there's really no reason that it shouldn't be on the right. JVC's whole range at one point had the door on the right. But talking of doors, what's the story behind this diagonal tape mechanism? Well, going back to the 1960s tape recorders, the early ones, they looked like this. And then over time, cassettes gained stereo and they started to be incorporated into hi-fis. And the machines naturally took on a similar design to the machines that had come before with the cassette laying flat and all the buttons on the top. It seems the ideas for this new music player were following the established systems. By that I mean a record player or an open reel tape recorder. Well, those go on the top and then underneath those you get a stack of what might include your amp or receiver, reverb, equipment, whatever, your other boxes. But the things that you want to put physical media into, well, those go on the top. But then some bright spark must have thought, well, you know what, this, this top is getting pretty crowded. If we could put the cassette deck into the stack of equipment, then we'd better take up less space. The only problem was that the cassette was really designed to be played flat. When you look at a machine like this, you can see that there are two metal pegs at the bottom that locate into the holes on the cassette. The cassette has to be inserted at the top first and then dropped down onto those pegs. You'll also notice that they're tapered larger at the top than the bottom. These really do hold the tape in very firmly. But to make the deck fit in a stack, there's got to be a different kind of mechanism. They come up with a diagonal loading system, and that meant the tape could still be loaded in a very similar manner with the top going in first and then getting pushed down onto the twin metal pegs, but you could stack up your cassette deck. So for a brief period, this became the norm, and a similar system was used by a number of different manufacturers. But then, as we saw, within a couple of years, Pioneer had already switched to a completely vertical system, although it still operated roughly in a similar way as the very first machines, in that the door wasn't responsible for holding the tape in place. The door was just a dust cover, like on, on my machine, and they carried that concept through for a few years, up to, say, 1979's doorless CTF-1250. But then again, at some point in the 70s, some bright spark must have said, you know what, why not have the door hold the tape in place? The twin metal pegs are now replaced with one short plastic locator stub, and rather than the interior mech being responsible for holding the cassette in place, it's now the job of the door. So once someone figured that out, pretty much everyone else then moved on to that new system, and that's what makes the tape decks with diagonal loading mechs so appealing to me. They were only around for a very short period, a few years in the 1970s, before they were made obsolete, and as a result, they've got a bit more interest, a little bit of appeal that you don't get on more modern decks. I've just got to show you one limitation this system puts on my model though. You've got to remember to open the dust cover door before you eject the tape, otherwise it gets jammed up behind it. Now, moving on to buttons. Over the years, the layout for these standardized somewhat. So I'm kind of used now to having record on the left next to play. But on this machine, rewind is where I'd expect play to be. And I'm also used to pause being at the end, not before stop. Talking of buttons, did you ever have anyone tell you that you should always press stop between switching functions like I'm doing here? And you should never do this, as it would break the machine. Well, there's a good chance the person telling you that was also the same person who would say, never do this with a handbrake. You should always press the button in, because otherwise it wears it down somehow. Well, of course, they're wrong on both counts. Well, at least as far as this cassette deck goes, Pioneer made a point of mentioning this in their brochure. Operation levers are designed to change from one mode to another without first pressing the stop lever. You are assured that operating the deck in this way will cause no damage whatsoever. So if Pioneer had figured this out 45 years ago, I can't imagine they were alone. So just like this is not going to do any damage to your car, 
I'd imagine with most cassette decks, this is perfectly fine too. Okay, let's move on to a demo of the timer function. The main purpose of this was to time shift radio programs. It works in much the same way as the external audio timers. You've got a clock that controls a power outlet and into that power outlet, you plug in your radio tuner. Now, because this is a Japanese deck and it runs off 100 volts, I'm powering it through a step-down power converter. So the power that's gonna be coming out of the socket at the back is also 100 volts. Now, I don't have a hi-fi tuner that runs off 100 volts, but I've got a radio that I can set to 110 volts, so that's gonna to have to do. So the radio is plugged into the power socket. The plug on the back of the tape deck is live all the time, except when the timer mode is activated. So this means the radio can just be used normally, independently of whether you're using the cassette deck or not. But now let's set the timer. So let's say I want to record something at 1 p.m. Now I set that time on the smaller dial. You can see that there's p.m. or a.m. indicated at the bottom, and each hour has six positions. So really the timer can be set with an accuracy down to approximately 10 minutes. So then I pop in a blank tape. When the timer is activated, the machine stays powered on for an hour and 40 minutes or so. So it's gonna to run to the end of this side of the tape, at which point the auto stop's gonna kick in. Now I've put this into record pause, and then I'll tune the radio to the station that I want to record at one o'clock. Now I check the recording level, and when I'm happy, I activate the timer switch, which kills the power to that socket on the back. So of course turns the radio off and the cassette mechanism as well. So now I can take off the pause and wait. Now at around 12.58 and 30 seconds, the device powers up. So the radio comes on and the recording starts. These storms across Cumbria, across South East England, heading to... This is BBC Radio 4. Hello and welcome to The World at One with me, Sarah Montague. The row over why we can't open schools. Everyone is blaming someone else. Now you might have also noticed there's a sleep timer function. Now this can be set for anything up to 90 minutes. And once it reaches zero, this also kills the power to both the deck and the outlet on the back. Now a cassette deck with a built-in clock really isn't too uncommon if you include all the clock radio cassette players. And Pioneer themselves even followed up this CT50T in Japan with the CT55T. That one had a vacuum fluorescent digital clock. But unless you know different, I'm pretty much sure that this is the only hi-fi component deck with a built-in flip clock. Now, for what was effectively the bottom of the range of machine of the time, it's Still a very nice looking component, especially with the lights in the room turned down. You can see the clock and the timer are illuminated. It's important to know that these operate independently of the power status of the cassette mechanism. As long as it's plugged in, that clock is gonna keep the time. Oh, and while we're here, have you ever noticed the connection between the Yamaha logo and the Pioneer one? If you haven't, not surprising, but they both use the symbol of a tuning fork. It's a lot clearer to see in the Yamaha one where they've got three, but for the Pioneer logo, the one that we're using here is a little bit more stylized. If you go back to the earlier version, 1946, when they started using this, it's a tuning fork overlaid on an ohm symbol or an Omega symbol. So yeah, bit of trivia for you there. But back to the cassette deck, there's a story here I haven't told you. Between unwrapping it and demonstrating it in this video, there was a full month of blood, sweat and tears when I was trying to get this thing working properly. I recorded over 10 hours of video that I really do need to edit down into something snappier. But when I've done that, I'll show you some of the issues that I ran into. Some of them were of my own doing and some were this thing fighting me every step of the way. It was certainly a learning experience, but that's something for another day. That's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.